did the frustrated cannibal do? Lay it on me. He threw up his hands. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode 7 of The Last of Us. There is a lot to go over in this episode, so we're going to talk about all of the Easter eggs from the game and the comic book, the hidden meaning in their trip to the mall, and how after watching this episode, it really changes the show. When you go back and rewatch the first two episodes, it makes you view them in an entirely different way. So this episode is about the loss of childhood. Ellie and Riley are basically two high school seniors who are about to graduate, and they're spending one last night as kids trying to work out their future together. There are lots of hidden details and symbolism spread throughout the episode, but in particular, there's the five wonders of the mall. Each of these wonders represents a different stage in childhood development. Infancy, toddler, school age, preteen, and adolescence. I'll explain each of these in more detail as we go along. This episode once again uses the structure of a flashback to better enhance the story being told in the present day. Unlike some shows I could mention, man, leave, leave Brooke and Boba Fett alone. I know, I know. So, as Ellie is facing these impossible odds and the circumstances of the present, she is having to draw on her past experience to help Joel survive. We also see that Riley was the last person that she loved, and that when we first met Ellie, she was still in a period of mourning. So, even though we didn't realize that Ellie and Joel were still grieving their loved ones at the same time, they both needed someone else to help them through this, and they found each other. So, a little background on where this story came from. It's actually a combination of two different Last of Us stories, the American Dreams comic book and the Left Behind DLC. The the comic book was co-written by Neil Druckmann, creator of the game and co-creator of the show, and he also wrote this episode. The comic book shows Ellie being transferred into her Fedra school, meeting Riley, and the two of them sneaking out to hang out in the mall. The difference is that the mall doesn't have electricity yet. Eventually, they run across some fireflies, including Marlene. So Marlene tells Ellie that she placed her in the Fedra school because she promised her mom that she would look after her. She goes on to tell Ellie her mother's name and to give her her mother's knife. This was partially adapted for the show. They didn't put you there. I did. And I think there'll probably be a future episode where we learn about the true connection between Marlene and Ellie's mother, Anna. The comic sets up Riley's love for the Fireflies, which is a main plot point of this episode and the DLC. Yeah, you keep saying that. What's DLC? Is that like don't go chasing waterfalls. No, that's, that's TLC. DLC stands for downloadable content. See, basically these days when you buy a game, they'll make add-ons that you can purchase for extra money. Not like in my day where we blew in a cartridge to make it work. Sometimes these add-ons are new guns or armor or different levels of racing, or in this case, a whole new story that fills in the gap of the original. In the original game, you don't see Ellie struggling to keep Joel alive. Now, that's all I'll say because of spoilers, but I mean, you get the idea. The story of the DLC is a lot like this episode, and I'll explain all those similarities as I go along. And by the way, everyone, if you like our channel and what we do here, we have a really fun merch store at shopzeroedition.com. We have lots of high quality tees, including our original trilogy t-shirt, Not the Bees, Top 5, where you can write in your top five movies or shows, and our newest shirt, The Doug Father. I do not make any money from this. Do not buy any The store this. really does help us out. So if you're interested, please shop at shopzeroedition.com slash screencrush with the link in the description. Now back to the Easter eggs. So the episode opens in the present day, shortly after Ellie has gotten Joel into shelter after he was impaled in the last episode. The landscape is gray and barren, really establishing that there is nothing and no one around that could help Ellie through this. Winter is always used in stories to show a low point for the character, when they can be near death. This way they pass through the trial with a new fortitude or maybe a spiritual connection that will allow them to face the final threshold. So to set these stakes, Joel says, Leave. And Ellie could leave him, easily. But as we see with her trying to leave Riley later on, Ellie doesn't walk away from the people she loves. This episode does pull this fake out, though, to make us think that she's leaving Joel, or at least to show us that she's considering it. This is one of many binary choices that Ellie has throughout this episode. Just like the choices you make when you're a teenager, her decisions will reverberate and determine the rest of her life. Now, Joel shoves her away because he's still trying to take on the role of her protector, like how Riley protects Ellie. But this episode transfers that role of the protector to Ellie herself. The flashback begins with Ellie in gym class listening to her Walkman. Now in the comic, the Walkman is her prized possession, and she became friends with Riley after she caught her stealing it. The song she's listening to is All or None by Pearl Jam, and once again, this show has chosen lyrics that perfectly match the episode. The song goes, it's a hopeless situation. So, both the present day and the flashback begin with Ellie in a hopeless situation, but for different reasons. In the present, it's hopeless because Joel is going to die. But in the past, see the next lyrics are, and I'm starting to believe that this hopeless situation is what I'm trying to achieve. So this reflects her hopeless situation in the past, where she is stuck in an institution that offers her no kind of real life. See, like, think of most teenagers in school who are told, hey, you have to do X, Y, Z so you can get a job and contribute to society. The best Ellie can achieve here at Fedra is to remain in this hopeless situation, to graduate Fedra school, be a Fedra officer, and live and die in the QZ. 
The chorus of the song, It's All or Nothing, All and None, also reflects the binary choices that Ellie is being forced into. She's either part of Fedra or she's against it. She either lets Joel die or saves him. And we'll talk about more of these decisions as we go along. When the flashback begins, she is moving into slow trot through gym class. And this is so Ellie. She's the kid who's more into having fun in life. She's not super driven. She's always quick to smile. Volume two, look, you get it? Too? Like T O O. And up until today, she's been able to live in like a bubble of childhood. Now she's being forced to make decisions. And by the end of the episode, she is running full tilt away from the zombies, but also to save Joel. Now Ellie's Fedra school has also been mentioned in a couple of episodes before. You think I chose that place? They put me there when I was a baby. It's for orphans. How long do infected live? Oh, I thought you went to school. It's a really shitty one. Now who taught you that? Fedra school. Figures. And you know what? It's good that Fedra is making the kids do laps because if Zombieland taught us anything, it's that to survive an apocalypse, you gotta do cardio. Rule number one, cardio. Zombies lead a very active lifestyle. Ellie begins the episode being bullied, which also happens to her first thing in the American Dreams comic. But in the comic, Riley stands up for her, which is alluded to here. Your friend fights. And just like in the comic, Ellie is immediately in trouble for fighting. But in the comic book, the Fedra officer just yells at her about how important Fedra is for protecting people. So later in the comic, Ellie already hates Fedra, calling them fascists. Now, I think the change they made for the show is much better. Captain Kwong makes a compelling case for her to believe in the institution. I care because no matter what anyone out there says or thinks, we're the only thing holding this all together. Now, when you're a teenager, you're looking for structure, for causes to believe in. That's why the military goes to high school recruitment fairs. And here we see that Ellie is susceptible to this argument. She'll need a job when she graduates, and the captain is offering her a real future. Let me help you out. Two paths ahead of you. Now he gives her a binary choice, the cup or keys. Path of the cup seems like a miserable cycle of death. Now it's interesting that the show chose an empty cup because there are connotations with that. An empty cup can symbolize emptiness, financial emptiness, like a beggar asking for coins. Also hunger and thirst, as in you have nothing to fill your cup with. But also an empty cup implies a spiritual emptiness. Psalms 23, five famously reads, thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The meaning of this is that God provides for physical and spiritual nourishment, while an empty cup symbolizes poverty and the lack of spiritual meaning in your life. Or Ellie could have chosen the keys. There's the other path. You follow the rules, you become an officer. Keys symbolize agency. The keys to a car make you the driver, and we already know how Ellie feels about cars. It's like a spaceship. Keys also imply that you have a home, a place to unlock. And then there's another Bible passage from Matthew 16. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So keys can also offer a spiritual fulfillment, but the captain is mostly tempting her with physical comforts. You get your own room, you get a nice bed, we eat well, we don't go on patrol, we're cool in the summer, we're warm in the winter. The officer is basically outlining the caste system that Fedra has established. Unlike Jackson, this is not a commune where everyone shares everything. It is an oligarchy where the people who have, have lots, and everyone else is divided into different castes. And of course, the problem with this system is that it oppresses people and drives them to rebel. For instance, Riley says that she would have been placed on sewage duty by Fedra. So Fedra offered her no future, so she ends up opposing Fedra. And we saw the end result of this system in Kansas City. <laughs> In fact, Kwong is aware of this danger. If we go down, the people in this zone will starve or murder each other. That much I know. Which is exactly what happened when Fedra fell in Kansas City. But mostly, the captain offers Ellie power. You get to tell the Bethanies of the world exactly where to shove it. And he tempts her with purpose. We're the only thing holding this all together. In Ellie's room, we see a lot of posters and drawings that tell us a lot about her interests and personality. First, notice that she loves to draw dinosaurs. Now, this is an Easter egg from the game, but it also shows her fascination with the past. She's always asking Joel about the world before. So the way they ran stuff in Jackson, was that how things used to be? You ever stay in a place like this? You fly in one of those? How did it even start? Now, this fascination of the past kind of culminates in her dreams of exploring space. And we see this love of astronomy all over her room. There's a poster for the Val Kilmer movie, Red Planet, various rockets and spaceships, a newspaper clipping about the Hubble telescope, which actually has a heartbreaking double meaning because the Hubble can show us all of these fantastic sites that human beings will likely never be able to visit, like how Ellie will likely never go to space. I mean, I guess we'll find out. Now, the poster right by her bed depicts the lunar cycle. Now, look, I could be reaching for meaning here, but this scene seems to reflect the episode's theme of childhood versus womanhood. A woman's cycle comes monthly and for thousands of years has been closely associated with the cycles of the moon. The moon is seen as a symbol of womanhood change and transformation, just like how after tonight, Ellie is about to leave behind her childhood for good. Ellie is reading the same Savage Starlight comic that she bonded over Sam with. 
No way. I love these. Only now we get to see the pages a little more clearly. The hero and her gun-toting sidekick storm into a room looking for enemies but find it empty. Now you could say this foreshadows their journey to the mall where we expect the place to be crawling with infected and at first it's not. But I think it's actually a reflection of Ellie's future. She thinks she's going to have a future with Fedra and then a future with Riley. And just like the characters in the comic, she has all of these expectations for how her life is going to go and then she's left all alone. The comic, by the way, is also the one that she reads in the game and it's also a collectible item that you can get. But most importantly, the room is filled with objects that remind Ellie of what she's lost. The knife in the comic was a gift from her mother. There's Riley's empty bed, and the Mortal Kombat 2 poster foreshadows the video game she'll play with Riley later. But Mortal Kombat is a game that is best played with two people, but Ellie is all alone. We also get a close up of two of Ellie's cassettes, Aha and Etta James. Both of these artists have music that is going to be featured later in the episode. So Riley breaks into Ellie's room pretending to be an infected, just like in the game. <laughs> And right away, she notices Ellie Shiner. Give me a name and I'll f him up. It was Bethany. Notice how Riley was Ellie's protector, a role that Joel has taken over in the present day. And just as Ellie is going to have to go on without her protector in the past, she is going to have to protect Joel in the present. Just like in the game, Riley has run off to join the Fireflies. And Ellie points out this puts them on opposite sides. In a few hours, I have drills. You know, where we learn how to kill Fireflies. But in the game, Ellie congratulates her. Here, congrats. Hey. Again, this is a great change that we see in the show, because if there's two things that'll make you grow up fast, it's puberty and politics. Riley tells her, I'm just saying, you can't fight everything and everyone. You can pick and choose what's important. And Ellie replies, Are they teaching you this at Firefly University? And this is exactly what we see the Fireflies doing in episode one. Every Firefly in Boston is gonna gather in this building, and you're gonna leave the QZ. And they were doing this because they were coalescing all of their resources around Ellie. It's also fitting that Ellie begins the episode ashamed of Riley for joining the fireflies, when that's exactly what she's going to be trying to do for the entire series. Yeah, man, I mean, you never even know where life's going to lead you. I've seen some things, dude. I've seen some things. <laughs> When Riley shows up, she gives Ellie another all-or-nothing choice. Come with me for a few hours and have the best night of your life. Man, there's a lot of deciding going on in this episode. Yes, because when you're a teenager, your decisions count for, like, way more than they do when you're in your 30s. Your teen years have a way of shaping your whole life. I mean, we force teens to make decisions like going to college or what to major in or who to date and or impregnate. And one of the reasons being a teenager is so stressful is because it seems like every single decision you make is life-altering. Because the these decisions can be. Every road not taken is like a new branching timeline. Ellie chooses love over duty and leaves to party with Riley. And by the way, if Riley looks familiar, it's because this is Storm Reed. She was in A Wrinkle in Time and in a very underrated movie called Missing. We did a breakdown of that that we need you to watch. What? We need you to watch it. As Ellie is getting ready to leave, she makes Riley turn her head. Turn around. You're so weird about that. And this is sweet because Ellie is weird about it because she has a crush on Riley. So then the two of them spend their night like any teenagers, stealing liquor off a dead guy who killed himself. I think you knew what he was doing. It's interesting because this guy likely bought these drugs off of Joel, and Joel is going to want that bag back. I need the bag back. When they sample the liquor, they say... This isn't moonshine either, it's like from before. And when the kids on this show talk about the before time, it's, it's really heartbreaking. I mean, they feel like everything good was in the past, and their futures are just bleak. Like the Pearl Jam song says, it's all or none. Now they're both casual about seeing a dead guy. In this episode, Riley alludes to seeing her parents die, but in the comic, it's like a way more graphic description. She says that her dad turned on her mom, and then she had to kill her father. The story she tells about being recruited from the Fireflies is different from the comics as well. See, in the comics, she tried to get recruited, but at first, Marlene shut her down. Now in the DLC, they revealed that this was just a test. That whole almost killing me thing was a test. She wanted to know I was committed. We did see the Fireflies actively trying to recruit Joel in the first episode. If you're feeling lost. You tell me to look for the light and I'll break your jaw. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the big change in this episode is that Ellie is not sympathetic to the Fireflies at all. Had Ellie and Riley not had this night together, they would have ended up on opposite sides of this ideological divide. They're fascist dickbags, and they're the ones that should be getting hanged for their crimes, not the people. While Ellie parrots the captain's words. In a way, Fedra kind of holds everything together. We're the only thing holding this all together. 
the two of them go skipping across rooftops like you do many, many times in the games. Now, in the game and in the episode, Riley discovers the mall, and she claims to have figured out that it's secretly on the Electra grid. But of course, later on we find out that it's actually a Firefly stronghold. And guys, this got me thinking, if Apocalypse Times actually happened, malls would be turned into fortresses where people lived. I mean, this happened in the Colosseum in Rome. After the Roman Empire fell, it became a place where people lived, occupying all the concession booths with businesses like butchers and shopkeepers. The mall would be a perfect place to defend from zombies. Anyways, Ellie and Riley finally get to taste that precious past that they miss so much. It's like from before. As we get a good old-fashioned mall montage set to AHA's Take On Me. Now, now this absolute banger of a tune features an epic high note. <laughs> and the lyrics are spot on for what the characters are feeling right now. The song's about two people spending the night together before the singer has to leave in a day or two. The song depicts a kind of aimlessness between the two people who don't know what their purpose is together, but they're enjoying one another's company. The lyrics go, we're talking away, I don't know what I'm to say. Tomorrow's another day to find you shying away. I'll be coming for your love, okay. Now I mentioned earlier that the five wonders represent these stages of childhood. So the first wonder is an accidental one. So fittingly, it represents nature's greatest accident, babies. Ellie is amazed by the escalator. Electric stairs? And if you didn't grow up around them, escalators are kind of magical when you're a kid. And by the way, this scene also taken from the game. So Ellie starts to run up it backwards. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm not moving. And what she's doing here is creating the illusion of infinity. To her, walking on the escalator seems endless. Just like when you're a baby, childhood seems endless. You're neither aware of the world or that you are a baby. You simply exist. Just like Ellie is in a state of pure joy on this thing until she trips. Kind of like how your infancy ends as soon as you begin to walk and you're constantly falling down and in pain. Also, the infinity of the escalator is an illusion. It may seem like she's staying in one place, but the escalator is slowly pulling her downwards. Just like being an infant creates an illusion of euphoria that is destroyed as we inevitably age and die. Now, lots of little design details in this mall, like here. There's a lens crafters ad where a guy has red drawn on his lips. Now, maybe the graffiti was meant to make the guy look like he has lipstick on, but in a post-zombie apocalypse, it looks like his mouth is covered in blood. The marquee of the theater says that a movie called Dawn of the Wolf 2 is coming soon. This is an Easter egg to the game. There's a poster for this movie in Sarah's room, and you also find it on billboards and other locations in The Last of Us 1 and 2. There's also an insert shot of a sign at the box office that says, Back in 5 Minutes. Man, what what is the story there? The apocalypse started to happen, but before the person went into the back to check on things, they just left that sign out? This one shot does a lot to show how quickly society fell. And then the two of them approach a Victoria's Secret. Haha, ha, no, I know why, it just looks uncomfortable. And this is another important part of childhood development, when kids start to wear their parents' clothes and imagine themselves as adults. For Ellie, it makes her a little sexually uncomfortable because of her crush on Riley. Nothing, I was just trying to imagine you wearing that. Shut up! <laughs> but after Riley leaves, Ellie takes this sweet look in the mirror to imagine what she would look like as a full-grown woman. Ellie! Uh-huh, I'm on my way! Next, the two of them go to the carousel, which is also taken from the game. Except in the game, it stops immediately when Riley gets on board. Here, we're allowed to linger for a little romantic moment. Hey, what's that song? Well, Philip Molina at the channel FilmWise pointed out that the song playing is just like heaven by The Cure. By the way, FilmWise posted a great breakdown of The Last of Us, highly recommend it. So the lyrics of this song go, Show me how you do that trick, the one that makes me laugh, she said. And I promise you, I promise you, I'll run away with you. And in the context of this episode, this is all about Riley showing Ellie all of this cool stuff in the mall, and kind of enchanting her with promise. Later in the episode, they do decide that they will run away together. Now this carousel does represent the next stage of childhood, which is being like uh, two to five years old. Rides like this are one of the first rides that you can go on without your parents. So they're a place where you first interact with your peer groups, much like daycare or pre-K. And much like the trip on the escalator, the carousel creates this illusion of eternity, like you could go round forever. I want a magic horse with like a million lights. I don't know how it's supposed to get better. There is an entire minute of the two of them on this thing with almost no dialogue, where they can just be together and happy. But this time in a bottle ends when the carousel grinds to a halt. Oh, come on. And as soon as it does, they start to argue about politics. Did you really leave because you actually think you could liberate this place? Don't say it like it's some type of fantasy, Ellie. Like I said, two things that force us to grow up are puberty and politics. Puberty changes your body, and politics changes your mind. It's when you start to see other people as if they're in different groups or factions. And this is exactly what happens when you start to go to school. We're like the future. You know, we can make things better. Now, they end things on the carousel on good terms. No. 
but the divisions are there. Next, we have a photo booth that represents when you start school. Ellie says, Is that a time machine? Maybe because the booth looks like the TARDIS or Bill and Ted's phone booth. But also, a photo booth is a machine that records time, much like school. See, before you start school, you kind of simply exist. But as soon as you start to go to school, you are defined by your grade number. We're organized into grades and then into classes. And within the classes, we create social groups and then we make friends. School is when we start to realize that we want to start recording time. We make drawings, we keep journals, we pass notes and take photos. Photos are only something we need when we realize that time is finite and that we are going to change. And a hallmark of school is picture day, yearbooks. Every year that you're in school, they take a photo of you to record your stage of progress. That's why I think the photo booth represents going to school. Now the rabbit in the photo booth is just like the one in the game, and just like in the game, they take a variety of silly pictures. Now I kind of think the scary one foreshadows what happens to Riley at the end of the episode. Very sad. Yes, it is. And there are more sweet little moments, like when Ellie says, Okay, yeah, get up. Okay, okay, sorry. But she keeps smiling at her after they split apart. And then immediately the photos start to fade, just like the memories of your childhood. Remember me. And that's what makes this episode so special. I mean, look, one day you and your friends went out to play for the last time and none of you realized it. But at least Ellie gets to remember her last day as a child. Also, the booth is called Starshot, which could be another nod to Ellie's dreams of being an astronaut. And then we come to the arcade, which represents your preteen, awkward, on the verge of puberty, oh my God, what is happening to my body stage? About a year ago, he noticed his voice was changing. He had terrible acne and had fur where there was no fur before. So at the arcade, there are lots of real games, such as Tetris, Frogger, Asteroids, and the Daytona 500 driving game. That's one that Ellie is particularly interested in because remember her fascination with cars. It's like a spaceship. The attack from Mars pinball is also real, and I thought that it was a fun inclusion. The Martian looks like an infected person for one thing, but also the final objective of this pinball game is to conquer Mars and defeat all the monsters, like how Ellie is now looking to create a vaccine from her blood that will defeat all the monsters. The game also features an Orson Welles-like warning broadcast. This is an emergency broadcast. Which is all too real if you actually live through the events of September 26th on this show. And just for a second, I thought they weren't going to have any money at all. And this whole arcade trip was going to be like the Twilight Zone episode where Burgess Meredith just wanted to read books in the apocalypse, but his glasses break. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. Now, in the game, all the machines are broken, and Riley has to describe a game called The Turning Tour. Man, for a second I thought I was going to play it. You still can. And it seems like the show was alluding to that when Ellie sees a Mortal Kombat game in episode two, and she says, I had a friend who knew everything about this game. Oh, and the move that Melina does in this episode is the same one that Ellie described. And then she swallows you whole and bursts out your bones. Uh. Also, Ellie eventually killing Melina probably foreshadows Riley's death later in the episode. Now, as Ellie and Riley are playing, however, the camera journeys out into the mall into a toy store filled with American Girl dolls. Dolls are a symbol of childhood. Little girls were traditionally taught to play with dolls to create a desire to nurture and to have babies. So a doll is a symbol that is tied to the idea of childhood, motherhood, and ultimately growing up. Dolls are also essentially fake babies. So the zombie in this store symbolizes how, buried within our childhood, there is always the knowledge that we are going to age and face our eventual demise. Dude, that's bleak. Yeah, I know, so is the show. Now notice that this infected person wakes up, which is appropriate because the scene at the arcade features a glimmer of Ellie's sexual awakening, which ultimately ends her childhood. Like right Right here, they almost have a little tease. And this moment shakes Ellie out of her childlike glee, and she suddenly remembers her grown-up responsibilities. Uh, it's getting late. I have to wake up and make my bed soon. But she's lured with the promise of a present. I do like gifts. And then Riley invites her to her bedroom, which is totally innocent for a kid's sleepover, but has a different connotation for these two young women who are developing feelings for each other. This is when Riley gives her the pun joke book that Ellie reads to Joel in episode four. I love the little detail here that they didn't get the computer joke. Um, how does a computer get drunk? It takes screenshots. What are screenshots? I don't actually know. All through this scene, they giggle like schoolgirls until adulthood finally intrudes. Ellie finds the explosives, and it's when Ellie realizes that Riley has been keeping the truth from her. Did you make these? Yes, Ellie put it down. To kill soldiers? And that their politics will always fundamentally divide them. In this case, literally. Ellie, I'm leaving! Riley wanted Ellie to come, but Marlene said no. And as we'll probably see in a future episode, this was likely so Marlene could protect Ellie because of a promise that she made her mother. At least that's the reason in the comic book. And by the way, this whole scene also lifted straight from the game. They're sending me to a post in the Atlantic QC. 
I argued with them to stay here. But you know how Marlene is. Also, small detail, but the mall is like the one in the American Dreams comic with like a giant glass ceiling above them. Ellie decides that she can't abandon Riley, so she turns back, mirroring how she's going to turn back and help Joel in the future. And then she finds Riley in a costume shop. Now, this is taken straight from the game where they also wear the same masks. But on a deeper level, the costume shop is a perfect choice for the final wonder. And this wonder symbolizes teenage years and becoming an adult. We all dress up for Halloween when we're kids as a way to get candy. But Halloween is one of the few silly childhood traditions that we get to carry over into adulthood. You can still dress up for Halloween even if you're a senior citizen or even a news anchor. In fact, in your 20s, Halloween is usually used to meet people and hook up. In girl world, Halloween is the one night a year when a girl can dress like a total language and no other girls can say anything about it. The store is filled with gravestones because, let's face it, the one step left after adulthood is death. It also foreshadows that Riley will die, and in a sense, Ellie will be reborn. Riley admits the real reason that she wanted to join the Fireflies. I don't know what it was like to have a family. I mean, I didn't have them for long, but I had them. I belonged to them which leads Ellie into realizing that she could be that family for Riley. So Riley swipes her Walkman, just like in the comic, and they have a dance party set to Etta James's cover of I Got You Babe, which is far superior to the Sonny and Cher version, and I will die on that hill. The song is probably most famous for its use in the movie Groundhog Day. But the lyrics here are just spot on for this show. The song is about two young people who are admitting they don't know anything about the world, but they know that they have each other. They say we're young and we don't know. We won't find out until we grow. Well, I don't know if all that's true, because you got me and baby, I got you. Just like in the game, they dance with these masks on. Now, the masks have a couple of different meanings. On the surface, the clown looks like an infected person, and the wolf is like a werewolf, a monster that transforms from a human like an infected. Werewolves also transform with the cycles of the moon, just like the poster that Ellie hangs in her room. But on a subtextual level, Riley and Ellie are both wearing metaphorical masks. They're disguising their real feelings for each other and their sexual orientation. When they take the masks off, they strip away the last of their emotional defenses and finally kiss. Their conversation afterwards is also taken straight from the game. Sorry. What? And this moment of sexual awakening is when adulthood, that's real life, finally interferes. So this is an old horror movie trope. The sainted virgin loses her virginity and is immediately killed by the monster. Now right away, Riley goes into protector mode, but Ellie has to step up and stab it in the head. And again, we're seeing a similar role reversal in the present day with Ellie protecting Joel. But it's too late and they've both been bitten. So this next emotional climax of the episode is intercut with the present day and Ellie trying to save Joel, just like these scenes are intercut in the game. So the parallel between these two scenes is clear. Ellie was helpless to save Riley in the past, so she refuses to give up on Joel in the present. And now we understand why Ellie was so terrified of losing her protector. Just a reminder that you're dead, I'm Set up fine. Ellie frantically looks through the drawers for supplies, which boy, you do an awful lot of in the game. Now, back in the past, Ellie has a perfectly normal teenage reaction to adversity. And by the way, you know that chart that we saw in the first episode? It showed how fast the fungus spreads to the brain. Why can't they just cut their limbs off? Like, no one in this show does that. They do it in The Walking Dead all the time. Whatever, just saying. And now we come to the true end of childhood, when you acknowledge that you are going to die. Childhood, especially infancy, allows us the illusion that we're going to be young forever, that death is just for other people or like a really long time away. Kids don't die! But now they have to admit that their time is running out. It ends this way for everyone sooner or later, right? Some of us just get there faster than others. This is similar to Riley's last words in the comic. All roads lead to the same end. And then Riley gives Ellie the last of her binary choices. Option one, suicide. It's quick, painless. Option two, we just keep going. And really, this is a fundamental choice that everyone faces every day. Do we live or do we quit? It's two minutes or two days. We don't give that up. In this case, they decide to spend their last moments together. And by the way, this was all foreshadowed by the body they found at the start of the episode, a grown-up who chose the quick way out. No one told him he couldn't mix pills with that shit. Riley and Ellie's decision also parallels the journey of Frank and Bill, who knew they were going to die, but wanted to go out on that final journey together. Ellie asks, What's option three? And Riley has no answer because the third option is one that they could never conceive of, that Ellie is actually immune and she is the key to fixing the entire world. So what, so what happened to Riley? Well, buddy, it's not pretty. So remember what Ellie said after she killed the guy in Kansas City. It wasn't my first time. So when Riley turned, Ellie had to take care of her. Oh man, that's dark. 
I know. So this also explains how the Fireflies met Ellie. They came down to check on Riley and they found Ellie instead. She was bitten, but she hadn't turned. And maybe like in the comic, Marley knew her mother, so they kept her alive. So this moment shows her final step in growing up. So in the present, she is able to do the adult thing and care for Joel. Overall, this episode really shows what you can achieve in a video game adaptation. Now we covered this in a past video, but The Last of Us is the best adaptation of a video game source material that I have ever seen. Video games are often built on fun repetition. They make it fun to kill zombies the same way over and over and over. But in a TV show or a movie, repetition gets boring fast. For instance, in the game, Riley and Ellie run away for a long time and they face more than one zombie. But in the show, one zombie is really all you need. So The Last of Us has dispensed with a lot of the violence in favor of character drama. And that character drama gives the violence on the show a bigger impact. But the show also adds depth to the existing character drama from the game. For instance, in the game, Ellie already kind of hates Fedra. But in the show, Druckmann decided to make her conflicted. She really could decide to stay with Fedra and live a comfortable yet depressing life. This gives added weight to her conflict with Riley and it makes it even more tragic when she chooses to stay with her. Uh, what do we do now? We're gonna figure it out. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.